and my husband has a monster. Oh. And I have some white chocolate thick toast. I don't know why that's what they called it, but that's what it is. Eat uh -huh. that white thick, damn right. <laughs> That's right, brother. <laughs> I don't want to eat anymore. <laughs> so here we are for some more educational content. You're doing a whole series on your channel. Yes, right? I am. So we're here for more Lindsay Nicole. And yeah. hold the white thing. Please. You got it. Thank you. I have a notebook. Ah, and handy a pen. All, All right. right. We'll be taking notes. Mm. Yep. If you haven't already watched the first video, go do that. Mm. Okay, uh, it's about the the Cambrian explosion, and today's mm. is about the or or oh shit, the Ordo Vician period or Vician, one of the two. I'm gonna go Vician. Boom. Okay. Um, hope you guys are doing well, staying safe and sanitized. I'm skitting. He's Chavez. I'm ready to get started. All right. Oh, gotta record it too. Nice. Than that. Hundreds of millions of years ago, after an extinction wiped out many of the strange creatures in the Cambrian period, a new wave mm -hmm. of animal diversity was about to unfold. It was the beginning of the Ordovician period, which lasted Ordovician. from 488 to 443 million years ago. There's a chance you've never heard of this period. It kind of lives in the shadow of the Cambrian, but it absolutely shouldn't. Because the Ordovician began with an explosion of diversity on its own and ended okay. with one of the most catastrophic mass extinctions the world ever saw, wiping out 85% yeah. wow. of life on Earth. This period wow. was filled with unusual forms and the beginnings of major players that still exist today, but it's oh, somehow forgotten squid. in mm -hmm. mainstream media or whatever exists of mainstream media on the prehistoric world. Today, I'm huh. gonna be introducing you to this forgotten period, its explosive beginnings, the species that shaped it and the disaster that brought it to an end. My name is Lindsay Nicole, and this is the history of life on Earth that we know of. That we know you know. might have seen the merch is finally out and i'm Ooh. absolutely stoked with how it came out it's called the that we know of collection featuring two shirts one of them with the geologic time scale on the back this one with a two-headed snake on the back which is cool as fuck and a smile it on hoodie which has facts and cool pictures on it i don't know if it's like weird to wear your own merch but i wanted to make stuff that i would wear <laughs> and i've been wearing all of it constantly it's all comfy as fuck the shirts are really soft i don't know if you can tell yeah. And the hoodie is really cozy, but still like cool to wear outside. You know, like a lot of hoodies are really comfortable. The best of both worlds. And that is exactly what I wanted. And I'm just stoked with how it turned out. So I highly recommend checking them out. You can, Cause I know that you can do that, but maybe I won't. But whatever the case, make sure to check them out. What the world looked like during the order. Please send me pictures. Cause it would make me really happy. All right, on to what the world looked like during the Ordovician. Just like in the Cambrian, most of the Northern Hemisphere was submerged underwater, with the supercontinent Gondwana and other land masses taking up the majority of the Southern Hemisphere. And throughout mm. this period, Gondwana started shifting towards the South Pole and eventually made it there. Remember that for later. Near the beginning of this period, okay. the global climate was generally warmer. The atmosphere was generally moist. Ugh. And during this time, a diversification <laughs> event was taking place that was essentially the Cambrian Explosion too, just 50 million years later. Only this mm. time, it was called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. What okay. the fuck is that? Okay. The Ordovician period needs a PR campaign because that mouthful is not gonna make anyone wanna learn anything. It's the G-O-B-E. The Gobi. The Gobi. Like the desert. Done. Matter of fact, I bet it has people making a run for it. Despite the tepid name, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Good word. Despite the tepid name, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event was a mm -hmm. big smoking hot deal. Animals were diversifying at an insane rate, replacing the Cambrian forms at the world most yeah. with the more familiar lineages that we have Ooh. today. Like the Cambrian explosion, this new diversity meant new ecological roles and complexity, exploring new habitats. Plankton were the hot new thing. So many adapted to get a slice of that. Life cycles started becoming more complex. A lot of invertebrate life cycles started in the water column as larvae or hatchlings making up a pretty good portion of the world's plankton. Plants have okay. made the transition to land, starting off as small, non-vascular little guys. No stems, no nothing, just mosses and liverwort type bills. Before they had arrived, the terrestrial world just knew bacteria and fungi. So mm -hmm. they were about to fuck shit up. Whether or not animals <laughs> started to explore land during this time is still very much up in the air. There's some okay. shaky evidence of potential animal tracks belonging to some sort of millipede or worm, but nothing super solid yet. 
that we know of. Regardless, the oceans were <laughs> popping off. Reef communities were starting to develop and many corals, clams, and snails started appearing for the first time. Horseshoe crabs came into the mix and crinoids yeah. and cephalopods were establishing themselves and mm -hmm. diversifying. Mm -hmm. Remember back in the Cambrian period, vertebrates were starting to develop with hyquicthes and pachyia type shit. Yeah. So what were the fishies up to now? Let's start off with my favorite. Feast your eyes on Sacaban Bassfish, <laughs> tiny jawless and common fish that lived about 470 to 450 million years ago. The armor was some cool new shit that a specific group of fishes, the Arundaspids, were starting to develop. Sacaban Bassfish is one of the best known and oldest Arundaspids that we know of. They're about 10 inches long and kind of look like tadpoles due to their flat body, massive head, and lack of fins, and their armor covered their no entire fins. body. Their head was encased in a shield of bony plates, and down their body, they had these rows of scoots, these stone-looking pieces that some scoots. animals have today. Like turtles on their shell have them, mm. birds have them on their feet, crocodilians, mm. etc. This helped them have a fighting chance against some of the pretty heinous predators of this period that we'll get to in a bit. Another I'm excited. Thing about <laughs> Sacaban Baspis was their front-facing eyes. Really makes them stand out against your average <laughs> fish. And also makes them look cute as fuck. I mean, this face, this face is ridiculous. He looks and if like you've been following rock. me for a while, you know I love this right. face. I even named one of my Patreon tiers after it. Da -da -da -da. Shameless plug. Saka Bam Baspis was not a very graceful <laughs> swimmer since they had no fins to stabilize them. It looked like tadpoles and moved like tadpoles. But Saka Bam Baspis displays some of the earliest evidence of a lateral line, which is a big deal for fishes. It's a sensory organ that fishes mm. have today that runs down their body that detects movement in the water. It's oh. what makes schools of fish so graceful, not bumping into each other or anything. Right. Serious mm. stuff. How about that tiny ass map? Like I had mentioned in the last episode, jaws hadn't evolved yet. We still don't have jaws. So they likely mm. fed on the seabed, sucking up little bottom dwelling organisms or maybe organic matter on the seafloor. Not much else they could do that we know of. Some other Stop fishes that. dealt with this lack of jaws in a different way with some weird ass fucking mouse. These are the conodonts, a group of oh eel my jaws goodness. fish. That are okay, hold on. Let's recap. It's been five minutes. We've gone through a lot of stuff. Okay. We're at like 480 to 440. Yeah. Give me the exact numbers. 488 to 443. And then where are we at with the, the name of the actual... Ex new explosion, new Cambrian explosion. The great Ordovician. Hold on. Ordovician. Great uh -huh. Ordovician. Uh -huh. Biodiversification. Event. Event. Boom. And of course, Saka Bam. Saka Bam Baspis. <laughs> Saka Bam Baspis. <laughs> that is not twerkable. <laughs> Everything's twerkable if you believe. I can see that. A group Conodons. of eel-like jawless fish that are thought to be related to hagfish today. Checks out. Ah. The Conodons were a really successful group. Ah, found ah. in <laughs> all over the world up until the Jurassic. So their fossils have been found all around the world as well. Originally, they were only known from their teeth, first discovered mm -hmm. in the 1850s, which were more unusual than most. So scientists had a tough time placing the teeth into what animal group they belonged to. Maybe mm. some sort of worm or mollusk. But then what? in 1983, a group of extremely well-preserved fossils placed them in the fish based on soft tissue found around these teeth elements. It showed an eel-like body, a notochord, remember from last time, mm -hmm, the vertebrate mm -hmm. trait, I do and some tweaky ass eyes. Damn. And of course, the teeth were in their mouth, but also down their throat. Absolutely vicious. Possibly used wow. to rip and slice their prey, but also maybe used for a more innocent lifestyle of filtering plankton. Whatever they were doing worked really well for them. Obviously, they were around until the Jurassic. That is like, 300 million years. So wow. this shit was nice. Let me show you one in particular. Pandaritus. Clearly oh there's a lot to take in here. And God. no offense to them. I say this in the most scientific way possible. This is some of the most heinous shit I've ever seen in yeah. my entire life. I will say this is a life restoration done by paleo artist Prehistorica based on a specific conodon specimen described in this paper. It seems like there needs to be some revisions to place the teeth more inside the mouth to resemble okay. hagfish more, but oh, the arrangement God. is heinous nonetheless. This is actually not even my point of bringing up Pandaritus. So let me get back to that. Species in this genus display evidence of being venomous. Some fossil specimens of the oh, teeth found cool. little grooves inside of the teeth, which yeah. indicate they might have had venom. Which, cool. if true, this means these would be the earliest venomous animals that we know of. So good yeah. for the jawless fish. No jaws, no problem. Moving on to our beloved trilobites. 
Tyler Bite! The yep. Ordovician was their bread and butter. They were doing all Roaches. sorts of cool shit and diversified much more than their relatives in the Cambrian. They had all sorts of new spines and weapons <laughs> as defense <laughs> against the new predators. Some the trilobites even evolved a shovel-like <laughs> snout to dig through the sediment. Some started swimming, some developed eye stalks, and some decided they didn't Ooh. need eyes anymore <laughs> at all. <laughs> Figuratively stalks. speaking, no I realize I, I speak like that sometimes, making it sound like animals are choosing their evolution. Obviously they're not, it's just fun to talk that way, but I figured I'd clarify. We're just having fun here. We got to. Having a good time. Another thing yeah. the tribal did, the armadillo roll or the pangolin roll, the ability to roll and yeah. lock into a ball. The lock and roll, if you will. That's also what my wife does when she gets beat up. <laughs> Fence mechanism against predators or other threatening triggers. Quick little sidebar, and I swear this circles back. I visited a pangolin rehabilitation center in Namibia back in 2019 called Rest, and the woman who runs it and studies pangolins named Maria told me a lot of what we know about the behavior of pangolins and their lifestyle is so cute. just a guess because they're unbelievably difficult to study. The second mm -hmm. they're even a little bit stressed, they roll up into a ball and there is no getting them out of it. They will die that way if they have to. And Damn. so it seems wow. like the trilobites had a similar perspective on life. A lot of trilobite fossils are often found in that mm -hmm. lock and roll position, which honestly, valid. The Ordovician yeah. also saw the biggest trilobite species that we know of, Isotelus rex. One of their complete fossils is 28 inches long. So, like I said, the Ordovician was the trilobite's prime time. This was their What's it book. called again? Right, Isotelus rex. Isotelus rex. Tillis rex. Mm -hmm. 28. These are the worst notes I've ever taken in my life. Fossils okay. is 28 inches long. So, like I said, the Ordovician was the trilobite's prime time. This was their Super Bowl. All right, that takes care of more than <laughs> familiar faces of the Ordovician. Okay. Let's move on to the stranger side, starting off with two okay. that look like Cambrian leftovers. Here's the first one. Enjoy this picture while I figure out how to pronounce it again. Meerithurin? Mier Six and a half hours <laughs> later. Meerithurin. You're probably thinking oh. that can't be the case. Well, read it and weep. This animal was found in Wales in the UK. And oh, to honor that, the scientists who discovered it used the Welsh language to yeah. construct the scientific name. And the and double, the double D, D, is D, D in Welsh th. is the TH sound. Why yep. do you know so that? It's Merithurin. Okay. Merithurin. I know it from romance novels. Ah, I see. He put his dick in <laughs> her vagina. <laughs> Venetrian. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> She's like, mmm, yes, mmm. <laughs> is that how you think my is that how you think my romance novels go? Mmm, it's oh not thrust, it's thrusting. Thrust. <laughs> so it's Mirithirin. It translates to bramble snout. Bramble, mm. which is apparently in reference to the animal's spiky proboscis. I looked mm -hmm. it up because I thought there is no way that word is not some sort of British chicken scratch. But according to the Cambridge Dictionary, a bramble is a wild yeah, bush. It's a type with of yeah. bush. I don't want to call it either of those things. I don't want to keep saying merithurin, mir and I don't want to call it bramble snout, so let's just call it Binks. No reason to make this any harder than it needs to be. Sure. If you watch okay. the first episode of this series, you might be thinking that Binks is some sort of leftover version of Opabinian which is pretty surprising because Opabinia was a lone wolf in the abyss of taxonomy right. for over a hundred years. Up until last year when Uterora was found <gasps> to be Opabinia's relative cool. from the same time. Turns out the day that Uterora paper was published, the lead scientist of the paper named Joanna Wolf saw a picture of Binks and was like, no fucking way. There's a third one. Would you believe the luck of that? Whether or not Binks was related to Opabinia is still a mystery. They have plenty of similarities. The proboscis, mm -hmm. a backwards facing mouth, legs underneath the undulating body flaps. But mm -hmm. Binks was alive 40 million years after Opabinia and had zero eyes instead of five. This is still practically breaking news. It was only published a year ago, so I will keep you updated. The next Cambrian leftover okay. in the lineup is a gyrocassis. Absolutely a grotesque. Gyrocassis. At about seven feet long, they were some of the oh, largest my. animals in the Ordovician period, and one of the largest arthropods to ever exist. What in that God's we know name of. is 
is Board that? of Vision blip, if you will. Let's go over whatever you could call this body plan. Like other arthropods, their bodies were segmented. Each body segment carried with it two sets of flaps to move themselves through the water. They also had frontal spines that carried some weird sort of mesh that seems to have been for filtering plankton. Right. This, along with the fact that they were very big for this time period and the abundance mm -hmm. of their fossils, have led scientists to assume that plankton was popping off in the Ordovician right. due to the great Ordovician. Biodiversity <clears throat> due to the great Ordovician biodiversity language biodiversification <laughs> due to the great Ordovician biodiversification event. Boom. God. Today, hundreds of millions of years later, we may take plankton for granted. It's just there mm. all the time, everywhere, and so small. But the explosion of plankton was a big <clears throat> deal for marine ecosystems. Opened up a whole new lifestyle and body mm. stack, large and slow moving. Plankton is an all you can eat buffet everywhere no need to be fast or maneuverable take your time right. kick your feet back exchange yeah. pleasantries and good-natured conversation get as big as you want move as slow as you want who cares there's food everywhere and everyone's too small to hurt you life is good right. think about it <laughs> all the filter feeders today are bigger than their active predator relatives basking mm -hmm. shark compared to a great white shark blue whale compared to an orca slip is the way to go. Other lineages mm -hmm. took note as well, like the cephalopods, who really got cephalopods. their footing in the Ordovician. The most well-known Ordovician cephalopods are the orthocones, ones with straight cone-like shells. If yeah, you've been to any stores for rocks or crystals or fossils or oddities, you've probably seen Orthoceros fossils alongside the trilobites. They are mm. unbelievably abundant, and they had relatives so that got much larger than ever before, like Endoceros. Can we also buy one of these? Right. Because the last time we could buy one. So can we buy one? I want to buy one. I would like one. We should make a fossil wall. Like an animal crossing. Like an animal, actually, like an animal crossing. Yeah. I'm down for that. Emeroceros, previously two separate species, possibly the same. We're going to group them together as Endoceros to keep it simple. Keep it Kay. Okay. quick. Big cephalopods with big straight shell that could get to 18 feet long, dude. They are the largest order yeah. of cephalopods to ever exist that we know of. Unsurprisingly, a lot of our Let's understanding go. of endoceras has changed since they were first discovered in the 1800s, as it usually goes. Early estimates put their maximum length at 30 feet long, based mm. on a shell that was reported to be that big and then was apparently destroyed somehow. But oh. no other shells that long have been found, hmm. so for now their max length is 18 feet long. Maybe one will mm. be found in the future and not be destroyed, but for now, it is what it is. As you would probably guess, most, if not all, of the information we have about them is based on their shells, since their soft bodies didn't fossilize. Mm -hmm. This has led to a lot of presumed characteristics based on their living relatives of similar size, the giant squid. So based mm -hmm. on their size, they were initially thought to be apex predators of the Ordovician, using massive beaks to break through the shells of other orthocones and trilobites and arthropods, tearing shit up like nobody's business. But a deeper right. look into their shells tells a different story. It suggests they were slow moving, oriented horizontally in the water column, and they swam horizontally. They were also widespread and abundant throughout the Ordovician period. They seemingly okay. played kind of the same role as a gyrocasis filter right. filters, taking filters. advantage of the all-you-can-eat buffet. This may Makes seem sense. like a jump, given the active predatory lifestyles of giant squid today, and other shallow water squids and octopuses, which are Again, mainly active predators. But exploring the deep oceans has allowed humans to understand that not all cephalopods do that. Exploring oh. the deep oceans has introduced us to some just little guys. Filter just feeder trap plankton squids? with some sort of mucus wet. Or like the yeah. vampire squid that just yeah. hangs on oh, yeah. snow, Literally just hangs out. So there's yeah, reason to believe that Endoceros was just hanging out too. And now, That's the moment not we've been waiting for, we kept talking about these new fearsome predators everybody had to adapt to and shit. I'm Our ready. fish, finds, and weapons on trilobites. The ever dismissive lock and roll. What were their formidable foe? Sea scorpions. Objectively <gasps> horrific. Sick. Objectively godforsaken. Objectively, Sick. <clears throat> whatever. This period marks the beginning. Right the down. Rise of the sea scorpion. Scientific term for sea scorpions. Because they technically weren't true scorpions, just more distant relatives to the ones we know today. Close but they enough. sure did look like fucking scorpions, and I'm gonna argue they were much, much worse. Because while the sea scorpions of the Ordovician, like Pentacopterus, got to a measly six feet long, oh, others in later periods my. would become the biggest arthropods to ever exist that we know of, and ventured into freshwater and even terrestrial habitats. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. We're gonna focus on the now. Pentacopterus yeah. is the oldest known Eurypterid out of the 250 Whoa. total that scientists have described and was That's alive cool. about 467 million years ago. They had massive, grasping limbs for trapping their prey. And fossil evidence suggests they got to about six feet long, like I'd said. There was also 
Megalagraptus. Slightly smaller at two and a half feet long, but hey, still at a length that would give me a heart attack if I saw one today. So, a win is a win. They're most well known for those oh spikes that I don't need to point out. Mm -hmm. Coming off of their third pair of appendages. Personally mm -hmm. seem a bit overkill to me, but clearly worked very well for them to find and trap prey, possibly located underground in the sediment. While sea scorpions lived on to terrorize the oceans for millions of years after the Ordovician, the vast majority of life at this time did not make it out. Like I said at the beginning, the end of this Big period is marked with a mass, a massive mass extinction. So, okay. just just to recap. Okay, 488 to 443. Yeah, million years ago, mm -hmm. something like that. So, at this point in time, yes. hella plankton everywhere. everywhere. It's yeah. abundant. Yeah, I can filter, so I'm big. Squid, yes. filtering squids. Big conehead squid. See, mm -hmm. look, I drew, I, I drew a big conehead squid. Did you really? Squid. It's see. not well. <laughs> But he got a cone head. Good. Okay. Um, I also tried to draw a trilobite. Trilobite? He's in there. He's With over their there. segmented bodies and now yes. elongated eye stalks. And some of them were also blind. Yeah, and some of them have spiky things. Yeah. They gotta and protect they do themselves. what with the roll? The little lock and lock, roll. Stop lock and roll. Stop lock and drop it. Stop Watch. I'll do this don't, you, don't, don't, you do don't, do you, don't you stab me. Don't you, don't you stab me. Okay, we have. <laughs> Sacabambaspis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they didn't have fins and they looked like pet rocks. But they did have the line. Yeah. What is it called? The landline? Something like that. <laughs> um, and then I wrote condodonts and all I wrote for them was weird mouth, big eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're eel like. <laughs> and I wrote big for Isotelus rex, which was the big trilobite, mm -hmm. 28 inches. Also, don't forget. Great Ordovician biodiversification event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Gobi. The Gobi. Gobi. Rest <laughs> in peace. And Opabinia, question mark. I don't know why there's a question mark there. I must have been confused <laughs> about something. Okay. And I wrote okay. no eyes. <laughs> Uh, sea scorpions, eurypterids. Eurypterids. That's 250 the different kinds of species. And Pentacopterus was 467 say, million 460. years ago. Yeah, and they were six feet yeah. long. Yeah. They were longer than I am tall. And the small version is two and a half feet long, which is still massive. Which is still humongous. Let's do it. The vast majority of life at this time did not make it out. Like I said at the beginning, the end of this period is marked with a mass, a massive mass extinction that wiped out 85% of species alive at the time. The second deadliest mass extinction that we know of just after the Great Dying at the end of the Permian, which we'll get to in a couple months. You've probably mm -hmm. heard that there have been five true mass extinctions in life's history at yes. least since the beginning of the Cambrian and we're currently entering a sixth. So a true mass extinction is when more than 70% of species alive at the time die out in a mm -hmm. relatively short period. So major events, very, very big events. So the Ordovician extinction is the first true mass extinction. And if I were alive during this period, I would have been fucking pissed the way this panned out. There were multiple phases of this mass extinction that had life bopping around all over the place. In the first phase, the earth got slept with a global cooling event. Remember during this period, Gondwana was in the Southern uh, Hemisphere making its way over the South Pole due to plate tectonics. That supercontinent, which carried with it an enormous amount of coastal ecosystems, became engulfed in glaciers because of the cooling. This led to lower wow. sea levels, which led to many of those shallow water and warm adapted species to get booted. This wasn't the yeah. end of the world because there were cold adapted species that were doing okay. Or more generalist mm -hmm. species that could adapt with the changes and made it out. They were chilling for a bit because that global cooling lasted from like half a million to 1.5 million years. Ah, Seemed to be smooth bit. sailing. Nope. Earth got slapped with a global warming. The ice age was over Damn. and the cold adapted species got kicked to the curb. Hung out to the Global oxygen levels in the water crashed. So anything left hanging by a thread got strangled with bare hands mm -hmm. and spit on. By who though? <laughs> what caused all this chaos? It seems as though the major villain in this scenario was actually the newly established terrestrial plants. A devastating shock. Really? Right These plants were interacting with the terrestrial environment oh, in ways that, that had so never been done sense. in order to adapt and survive. This means impacting carbon dioxide levels. That's the right. Place, weathering down rocks on coastlines that released yep. different chemicals and nutrients into the ocean, which fed marine plants, which led yeah. to algal blooms that sucked up all the oxygen in the water. The transition of plants to land was a major event, which meant major effects 
effects that went along with it. While this initially had horrific impacts on the animal life that still only existed in the water, this transition eventually paved the way for them to follow them onto land. And okay. that is for the next video. My last note was terrestrial plants equals moida. Okay, not bad. Anybody having trouble following along? Get over it. We're moving forward. I really wish I had taken notes in the first video. Uh huh. So you can kind of compare. Yeah, so I can compare. Yeah. But I'm going to have this notebook from here on out. Yeah, for and the rest I'm, of them. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to compile a test for Chavez to take, Ooh. and I'm going to make him take it. Ooh. And it will not be an open note test. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this. Um, if you guys want, feel free to watch us watch her watch watch us watch her answer questions yeah. and if not i hope you guys enjoyed it leave your action requests and recommendations in the comments below and peace out hope it's gets it's getting lit can you tell me why my bedroom was invaded by ladybugs in november in mississippi yes ladybugs like warm in november it's becoming colder so ladybugs go inside to seek warm to avoid <laughs> cold in the winter Smart. which sucks i've only really experienced this once because in California, it doesn't get that cold. But when mm -hmm. I lived in Minnesota to work at the Big Cat Sanctuary, I lived that. on a farm seven miles out of town, and my place was covered in ladybugs. Yeah. Like, oh, that would be hundreds horrifying. Hundreds lining the windows and shit. Ugh. It was like, it, it felt like the, it, it was like the apocalypse. It yeah. It smelled horrible. Vacuum them Ladybugs, like, they're really cute on their ladybugs own. Stink? You know, just one at a mm -hmm. time outside. But when you have them lining your windows in the hundreds or thousands, it smells like shit, it smells horrible. It smells like old clothes that were put into a compost pile with garbage and <laughs> things that shouldn't be in a compost pot. And they can leave what? like orange stains on ah! stuff. It's just, it's 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 unpleasant ah! from the human experience. So ah! they're kind of just like ants, they find their way in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you gotta use like pest control stuff. They're probably getting in through cracks and windows and stuff. At least that yeah. was the case for my- Gotta race, redo your linings. Was, like 300 years old, so, all right. Next, what is your least favorite animal? Mm. It feels weird to have a least favorite animal because like everything's just doing their own thing, you know? I feel like the only way to answer this is to have a least favorite animal from actual experience, like not just the way they look or anything. And so right. I'm gonna say, Blister beetles. I dealt with them in Namibia. They have these uh. like, bright stripes all over them. And any bright colors that I had on when I was walking around, they thought was a flower. So Damn. I had on a white hat or a red shirt or whatever, they thought it was a big flower. So they would come at you and then they would realize that you're not a flower. And if they suddenly felt threatened, they would spray this fucking liquid all over oh, you. Oh, damn. Like painful blisters for like two weeks, which really never happened to me, but I know somebody who had a blister beetle land on her mouth <gasps> and then she swatted it away and the blister beetle sprayed her mouth and she had like blisters all over her mouth for two weeks that were super painful. So that sucked. So I would say Damn. that's my least favorite animal. I feel like that's why she wears all black now. I know, right? Like it just sets in. She's like, I'm done with color. You'll never get me again. Oh also, my God. saying that you can't have like a least favorite animal because they're all just doing their own thing is such a like, scientific oh, she's like, like Gandhi. Dude. yeah like, it's very because uh, wow. normally people are like oh i don't like this animal because of this and she's like but all things have their place in nature yeah you know that's so i love serene. it i love that for yeah. her yeah had a great time i'm leaving now goodbye